Alcohol will do a number on your skin too. And I'm not talking about like if you have a glass of wine at dinner, I don't think you're going to see too much there. But if you're consuming alcohol regularly, your skin will be more dehydrated. And you'll also just struggle more with issues in volume on the face when your hydration levels change like that, particularly the under eye area. We have a Maylar fat pad here. I get a lot of that where patients come in and like, some days my eyes look horrible, some days they look good. And it's a lot of that has to do with the fluctuation of your water, how much water you're holding on to. If, for example, if you have, you know, margaritas and Mexican food, like I'm puffy the next Nobody day. Nobody does that. My, <laughs> my rings are tight. My eyes look a little puffy. And then when you're eating super clean, you're going to notice less of that. So water intake is definitely, it matters. <laughs>
it's truly less is more. And what I mean by that is you don't need 100 products. You don't need a 10 step routine to achieve your best skin. You just need a few of the right things for you. So it's easy to get caught up in, and even I do, if I go to Sephora, I really like that store, but I get sucked in and I start looking at all the pretty labels and that looks fun, this looks cool. And But to be honest, a lot of that stuff, it kind of is junk, you know? I mean, maybe they have a few great things, but. We don't want products that are fit, you know, packed with fillers. And what I mean by that is perfumes and parabens and all these extra things that just beef up the product. Less is more. So with your skincare products, I am a huge advocate for medical grade skincare. And what that is, is it is skincare that is carried and sold by medical professionals. And that's because it is a higher potency. So it's more, more pure active ingredients. So no fillers, no junk, no fluff no perfumes, just pure active ingredients. So they're very transformative. So you can use a few products like that and they really work. And I think that's what gets people when they try medical grade skincare for the first time and they use a few awesome clinical based products. They're like, oh my gosh, my skin, this works. It's actually changing. I, I can't believe this because like so many of us in the past, they've spent hundreds and thousands of dollars on all this different stuff that they have in their bathroom and nothing really works. Yeah. So you're essentially saying that it's great to get makeup at Sephora, but perhaps not skincare. Correct. They have a lot of amazing products, and trust me, I have a Sephora account. But really I think, when you come in. I'm sure, I'm sure, yeah. but um, I think when it comes to your skin, you know, if you really want to get serious about your skin and you want to anti-age and you want to have the most polished, clean, fresh skin, you really do need to invest in quality skincare and not only good products, but also good guidance. And so seeking out um, an esthetician or a provider, a nurse practitioner, um, an aesthetic practice where you can go and get the help you need to help someone understand, you know, what products should I be using and how do I use them? Because even if you have the best products, if you're not using them properly, you might not be getting the best results that you could be. And there's all kinds of different products, right? So when I was thinking about coming and talking to you, I was looking at some of the stuff that I have and there's glycolic acid and koji pads and salicylic acid and retinoids. Mm -hmm. um, those would all be considered, right, topical acids? Yes. Who needs them? What are they for? How could someone figure it out? Because I, I think that the landscape is pretty confusing and also important, right? Everybody, and let's say we, it's not even just for vanity. It's still something that you want to take care of. You go and you exercise and eat right. You get routine blood work. You should probably also take care of your skin, not just on your face, but on your body. Absolutely. Yes. And so all of those acids that you were kind of spelling out, those are all in one category. So in skincare, we have different categories. You have your cleansers, you have your moisturizers, you have your exfoliating acids. And so salicylic, glycolic, kojic acid, retinoic acid, those are all different kinds of exfoliating acids. And so each one kind of has its own specialty per se. So you know, retinoic acid is going to be great for turning over skin cells and just kind of a gold standard for anti-aging, wrinkles, texture, texture pores. Kojic acid is amazing for evening out your skin tone. So if you suffer from sun damage, melasma, PIH or PIE, post-inflammatory hyperpigmentation, the little spots that you get that are left behind and acne mark, kojic acid is amazing. It just It's like a little magic eraser, wipes all that away, cleans the slate. Um, when you're talking about salicylic versus glycolic, again, that's where it's just getting the education or the guidance as to what's right for you. So those are your hydroxy acids. You have salicylic, um, which is your beta hydroxy acid. And then you have glycolic, which is your alpha hydroxy acid. And so when you look at those, they're different because your salicylic is going to dive a little bit deeper into the skin. It's an oil loving molecule. So that's going to think of it just going in and kind of cleaning out those pores, getting rid of acne. Um, I lean towards salicylic when I'm looking at acne prone skin, rosacea, when I want anti-inflammatory properties, salicylic's amazing. Whereas glycolic, that's a water loving molecule, so it's gonna work better on the surface of the skin. So I lean towards my glycolic when I've got a patient in front of me with just really thick, or, you know, weathered skin, and we just really want to turn that skin over. If they have a lot of trapped closed comedones and we just really want to bring things out, glycolic is amazing. Um, so knowing what you're treating is going to, you know, help us determine what exfoliating acid should you be using. And do you treat them, would you stack the acids? 
Absolutely, and that's where we have to build a tolerance. So when you're starting out, I have people start with just one, and then as your skin becomes acclimated and you get used to products and you, you build a tolerance for them, we increase use and or we stack different acids together. So for example, when I, I personally love to use, and I personally use retinoic acid and kojic acid because I love the benefits of a retinol. It's a gold standard. It's going to tighten my so pores. It, does, it works. So oh everybody gosh, is yes. saying, so you should, and that's, um, so it's a retinol, right? And yep. that's prescription. Is it prescription only for the most part? Well, so retinoid is sort of the umbrella in which we have retinoic acid and retinol. And so there's a difference there. So retinoic acid, for example, tretinoin, is a prescription. Um, however, retinol, something that I carry in my practice, it is prescription strength in its nature, but it is essentially over the counter if I give it out in my practice. It's a little confusing, but um, basically to keep it easy for you, Retinoic acid, like a tretinoin prescription, for example, is pure vitamin A. So it is the acid in its purest form. It's very strong and it's very harsh. For the right patient, that's okay. Um, but when it comes to retinoids, I always explain to my patients, it is a marathon, not a race or a sprint. You want to go slow with it. Retinol is going to be a more I don't like to use the word dilute because it makes people think it's not as good, but it is not as strong. It's a the way it converts in our skin, it's that it converts to that retinoic acid slowly over hours. So it's not throwing that harsh dose. It's like one tenth of the dose, you know. Um, so it's not so pure, it's not so harsh and drying. And honestly, in the years I've been doing this and the thousands of patients that mm -hmm. I've helped, I can definitely say using a retinol for most is much more effective than using something like a tret or retinoid. Um, and that's because less is more. We can build a tolerance. We can go slow over time and allow your skin to adapt. When people use tret, usually what happens is they're not compliant. It's so harsh. It's so drying. And their skin looks worse. Yes. I, th I think that I probably did that uh, before I knew you. And I, I kept hearing all this, oh, you should use this. Retin-A, you know, this stuff is great. Yeah. And I'm like, oh my God, this looks terrible. Exactly. And then what happens is you're like, you get non-compliant because like, it makes me too dry. I don't feel like dealing with it. You're walking around with this red, chafed, dry skin. You're irritated. It's uncomfortable. So if you use a retinol that's amazing, it's going to take a little bit longer. But in the oh. end... So with retinols, I say you really need to give your skin about 12 weeks, up to 12 weeks to fully adjust. And that's going to depend on your sensitivity. If you're somebody with super sensitive skin or with a lot of acne, it's going to take you longer than someone with a thicker, more resilient skin. Just a couple weeks. I mean, you're going to see improvement immediately, but to get those full results, it definitely takes a few months. And then it's just maintaining. Um, but with a great retinol, just like taking it slow over time, getting your skin used to it, then you can bump up the frequency but you can definitely anti-age your skin. It's a gold standard. It's gonna help with pores, wrinkles, texture, tone. And so that's something that you can do from home to completely transform your skin. And it's not gonna make any it's it's not gonna make anyone look worse. So if no. you start it and someone is like, Oh, you didn't I, I didn't look good, it was probably because it was just too high of a dose or yeah, the too much, too fast, yeah. too harsh. Yeah, so I would just take it slow. And there's things that you can do as you adjust to exfoliating acids when you're first getting used to them. You can go ahead and put a little moisturizer on top. Eventually, we want you to get away from doing that so you're getting you know, the most pure dose. But when you do neutralize the acidity a little bit with a moisturizer, it will help you build that tolerance so you can kind of go slow with it. And you may start with your exfoliants just three times a week, then build slowly. You're going to go every other night, and then we'll get you to a point where you can go nightly. Um, but even when you use an exfoliating acid nightly, I still have all of my patients take one night a week as an off night. And on that night, you won't use any exfoliating acid. You will just use moisturizer and hydrating serums to really balance out mm. your routine. What about, so should every, everybody should use that at some like some part of their skincare? Yeah, that's regimen. the one thing too, especially you know, I deal with all kinds of patients. I have college students that are on a budget. You know, some people have other things that they like to use. 
that's fine. But if you're going to invest in, you know, something medical grade, I highly encourage that to be your exfoliating acid because that is the piece of your routine that is very transformative. Yes, we want you having amazing cleansers and moisturizers and serums, but your acid, that's your workhorse. That's going to change your skin. So everyone should be on some type of an exfoliating acid because we want to turn over skin cells. That's the big thing. As we age, we slow and slow the rate of which we turn over new skin cells. So if you look at a baby, our our, yeah, our girls, our, their skin yeah. is so glowy and perfect, you can't even see a pore. But as we get older, our skin becomes more dull because we're not sloughing off those cells as quickly. So when we use an exfoliating acid, they all have that same effect where they tell dead skin cells on the surface to go ahead and slough off, so then our body regenerates and makes new ones. So it keeps your skin more bright. And this is important. Again, you know, I think a lot of women are really interested in skincare, but it really should be universal. Men and women um, can benefit. It's, it's probably something that they just aren't thinking about as much. But guys out there, trust me, you need this. Yeah, um, you do. It's men should look and feel amazing in their skin yes. as well. And I have a lot of male clients that love their skincare. I, I it's I'm so happy to hear that that men are getting on the bandwagon. It's getting more popular. When I first started doing this 13 years ago, there was definitely not as many men walking through the doors. It used to just be wives pulling their husbands <laughs> in, but actually I had a scenario recently that was cool. The husband has been coming in for a long time now and he finally just got his wife to come in. So that was cool. That's amazing. Yeah. So um, I want to talk also about, so you've got the acid and what about sunscreen? Is that a key... Yes. Does everyone need it? Because there's a whole host of conversation about don't get sun, get sun. I know. I mean, it's, sunscreen, mineral versus... I guess synthetic. it is uh, 2022 and everything is controversial. Because it wasn't like that before, but, right? Yeah. For the last 10 years, probably, there hasn't been a lot of controversy about should you use sunscreen or shouldn't you? Yes. And, and truly, I firmly, wholeheartedly believe everyone should use SPF every single day. Um, sunscreen does not cause cancer, you know, it is, it prevents cancer. And that's the main reason, honestly, for using SPF daily is we know now in 2022, the risks of skin cancer. Um, and so to, to keep your skin and your body healthy, you need SPF. And then second to that, of course, the anti-aging benefits are huge. Sun is truly like the number one thing that causes aging, photo aging. So even when you're driving in your car, the sun coming through your window is aging your skin. So that causes wrinkles. It causes sun damage. It causes laxity. It eats away at our collagen. So SPF, not only will it protect you from cancer and you know, from getting sick, but it's amazing for aging. So it's, what number SPF do you typically recommend? I use every day a 40. And so, you know, in theory, the higher the SPF, the longer you can go without needing it. But I really recommend that people reapply their sunscreen every two hours when they're if, in the sun. If they're in the sun. Yeah. If you're going to be at work all day and, you know, you're not necessarily in the, in the sunlight, you're okay if you don't reapply as often. Um, there are things you can do that can make reapplication really easy. Like we have awesome powder kinds now that you can just kind of swipe on throughout the day. But if you just do it in the morning, you're done, you're protected. But if you're on vacation and you're going to be outdoors and you're at the beach or outside with your kids, you really should reapply every two hours so that you are ensuring that you're protecting yourself. Do you think that the sun or the, the lights that we're under make a difference? Do you think that the, the lights, even if it's indoors, does that, do we know, does that affect well, the skin? In theory, through windows and things like that, we shouldn't be getting the UVB rays, but you definitely still could be getting UVA rays. So I think that, you know, at some point, if even if you're inside, you probably are going outside to get inside. But you're the driving. fluorescent lights and the lights overhead, that doesn't seem to impact aging, you don't think? Not the way that the sun does. No. Yeah. I think as long as you are, you know, protecting yourself with your SPF, you're protected throughout the day as well. And in terms of mineral versus synthetic, is there a difference or is... Yeah, that's one of the big debates, chemical versus chemical. mineral yeah. sunscreen. And, you know, my opinion is I think that there is a... So to break it down, mineral sunscreens are going to be your sunscreens that have titanium dioxide and zinc oxide. Those are kind of known more for reflecting the sun off of your face. Chemical sunscreens are going to contain chemicals that... And when we, this is where it gets tricky. When you hear the word chemical, some people think that's a bad thing. But I'm like, 
chemicals are not all bad. Everything in moderation, right? So it contains a small percentage of chemicals that will absorb those bad rays and they essentially turn them into heat and get them off your body. So they're just two different ways of protecting yourself from the sun. And so I think if you're somebody who's really, really concerned with the chemical ingredient and it's something that bothers you, then just use a mineral sunscreen. Um, so I think they're, you know, I, I see people's point there why they would maybe not want to use a chemical sunscreen. But again, in my professional opinion, with the small amount that we use, everything in moderation, I think it's doing more good than bad. And I think it's totally fine. And would someone just, would you say the best case scenario is to cover up and the places that you can't cover up, you should use it? Absolutely. Yes. If you are, you know, fair skinned and you are going to be in the sunny Australian sun all day, you should be wearing a long... You shouldn't go. Yeah. Right. You know, cover your body as much as possible. Hats, you know, sunglasses, especially if you're melasma prone or you have pigment on your face, sunscreen's great, but you still need to cover from the sun as much as possible. Let me ask you this. The... Um, the shade of the skin, does that make a difference between how much sunscreen that you need or in terms of wrinkle resistant or sun protective? Uh, yeah, agents? no, that's a good question. Um, and so the more melanin you have in your skin, so the darker your skin is naturally, technically the you are a little more protected from the vulnerabilities of the sun. So you're more fair skin types. You are at a higher risk for you know photo damage, skin cancer, things like that. But that doesn't mean that you shouldn't wear SPF because you're darker skin, because you're still, you still can get skin cancer. It's just not as likely, but also to think about anti-aging. So, um, and just the, the appearance of your skin. I have many dark skin clients who suffer from pigmentation issues, melasma, hyperpigmentation and hypopigmentation. So in order to prevent that, if you want that flawless, clear skin, you definitely need to wear SPF regardless of your skin color. Uh, you bring up a really interesting point. So there's the hyperpigmentation and that would be things like melasma, um, what else? Is there anything else? Melasma, PIH, which is post-inflammatory hyperpigmentation. And that's when if you have acne um, or any kind of injury to the skin and it leaves behind those little dark spots, a lot of people deal with that. Um, and then there's just your freckles, sun damage, okay. things like that. And you said something interesting, it, hypopigmentation. Mm -hmm. And are, are you talking, Is that would that be like vitiligo or are there it, other yeah. things that cause hypopigmentation? A lot of times it's injury of some sort that will strip the skin of melanin and then you are left with white spots. And the hard thing about that is once that happens, there's usually no coming back from that. Hypopigmentation, it's really difficult to treat. But what happens is if you have spots of hypopigmentation and then you get a lot of sun, the skin surrounding those areas get really dark and it makes the hypopigmentation look worse. So to keep your skin even, you have to protect the parts that aren't hypopigmented. But hypopigmentation can happen from injuries. Um, some people are born with it, like vitiligo, things like that. So it's not as common as hyperpigmentation. And are there, so the, is, are there treatments for both the hyperpigmentation and the hypopigmentation? Really? The, yes. And the biggest thing is going to be SPF and then topical correction. And then we also do have some lasers that work really well to lighten the pigmentation. With all this talk of skincare, I think we should talk about hydration. And that's where one of the sponsors comes in, and that's Element, spelled L-M-N-T. If you've been listening to the show, you know how much I love Element. And they have a tasty, salty electrolyte drink with everything you need and nothing you don't. It contains science-backed electrolyte ratio of 1,000 milligrams of sodium, 200 milligrams of potassium. 60 milligrams of magnesium, none of the junk, none of the BS. Element is formulated to help anyone with their electrolyte needs. I frankly really struggle drinking water. In fact, I, I started this program called 75 Hard and it calls for a gallon of water a day and that's really hard to get down. So I've just been throwing in some electrolytes. Hopefully I'm not breaking the rules here. I'm going to have to check on that, but Element really does it for me. You can head on over to Drink Element dot com slash Dr. Lion. And right now they're offering a free sample pack with any purchase. That's eight single serving packs free with any element order. It's a great way to try all the different flavors. I'm obsessed with their chocolate melody right now. Head on over to drinkelement.com slash Dr. Lion and it's totally risk-free if you don't like it. 
You can share it with a friend. They'll give you your money back. No questions asked. And lasers are amazing. And I, I think that people don't talk a lot about that. You don't, you don't really hear it it's just so frequently. You guys do lasers here. Are there particular lasers that you think that everybody should do um, at least once or yeah, once a year? For absolutely. Generation? I'm a huge proponent of lasers. And so when I have a patient come into my chair, um, of course, I'm doing you know their injectables and their skincare, but I also refer pretty much all of my patients over to our estheticians who head our laser department. And I try to incorporate laser into everyone's skincare plan because it's so amazing for just overall skin health. So lasers are going to, there will be so many different lasers and how to And choose. it's actually really confusing. It is. <laughs> it's the common theme here. So there's a lot out there, so it's confusing, but it's all about, you got to find a provider that you trust who can help guide you what is going to be best for you. So a couple gold standard lasers and ones that we have here is BBL or IPL. That is my favorite. It has been around forever and it truly is the gold standard for hyperpigmentation. And what, and what does that stand for? Is that the broad? Broadband broad light or intense pulse light. They mean the same thing. You also hear it called a photofacial. Um, but that is basically where we use a filter and different wavelengths of light. It's going to travel through the skin and pick up on the pigmentation. So for example, if we're trying to get rid of sun damage, that laser is going to be able to see the dark spot against your natural melanin and pull that dark spot up and out of your skin. So it's a way to even your skin tone. And what will happen is they'll treat the face and all of your pigment will get really dark and peppery for a few days and then it falls off. So don't do that before a big event. Yeah. Any kind of laser, any kind of aesthetic treatment, I recommend doing at least two to four weeks out from your events. So what are the other lasers? I love, so I love my IPL BBL for evening your skin tone. And how often do they if, do that? So when you're just starting out, if you have a lot of pigment or goals that you're trying to reach, you may need a series. Typically that's gonna look like three treatments spaced about four weeks apart. Um, when you're doing maintenance, you're gonna come in like once a year for that. So, and that's with all skin health. I relate it a lot to, to working out. One treatment, one workout, you're not gonna be ripped. You have to, you might be. <laughs> <laughs> if you're you, you'll be ripped. Um, but you have to commit to the process. So you have to keep you know, doing your due diligence. You have to be consistent with your skincare at home. You have to be consistent with your maintenance plan. So coming in and getting that annual laser for skin health, you know, getting your injectables every few months, doing your skincare at home, those things are all gonna add up over time and you know, allow you to have the best possible skin year round. Um, but back to your question about the lasers, I also love V Beam. That's another what is it gold V Beam. V Beam. That's another gold standard laser, been around forever, and that is really um, the best laser for redness, rosacea, broken vessels, anything like that. So if you're dealing with reds in the skin, um, broken capillaries, rosacea, and anything inflammatory, it's an amazing laser and for that. How, how does the, that laser work? So it targets the oxyhemoglobin in the blood. So it will pick up on redness and kind of pull it out of the skin. So it's, it'll also treat, it'll kind of cauterize little vessels. So if you have little broken vessels on the skin or by the nose, it will get rid of those as well. And I'm sure the listener is thinking, oh my gosh, you know, does this hurt? And uh, if so, is there concern about the provider doing it? Because it, it just seems lately that there's so many med spas and I don't know how hard it is to acquire a laser if they require training, but it, do you need to be concerned with the capacity of the, the provider? Yes, for sure. And um, so it, not, all of these things, you know, it, a laser is a little bit painful, but there's definitely comfort measures that we take. We use numbing cream, we use ice and fans, and we keep you so comfortable so it's over before you know it. But I'm not going to lie and say it's completely painless. Oh, come on, guys. But, toughen up, man. Yeah, if if this, I mean, <laughs> beauty is pain. So <laughs> they should be. But I mean, it's just no. like in the spectrum of, of everything, it's. it's it totally doable. It right? is, and a good provider will help you stay co as comfortable as you can during the procedure. Um, but yes, it totally matters, and I always say with, with an injectable, with a laser, the treatment that you're getting is only gonna be as effective or as amazing as the hands that's holding it. So, you know, lasers are very powerful, and so um, we need to make sure that the right settings are being used. That The way that that laser is used is going to be totally different on someone with dark skin than light skin than, 
you know, it, it depends on your skin type, your skin tone, um, all those things we take into account. So it needs to be someone very educated who's not going to burn you or cause injury or make your skin worse. And so that's where it comes to vetting a really great aesthetic provider. And there are places out there, you know, honestly, Instagram is an amazing tool. Um, there's a website called realself.com. It's a forum where you can vet providers and you just have to do your due diligence and word of mouth is huge. Find providers in your area and do your research. Make sure they're experienced, that they've been doing it for a long time. Look at their before and afters. You know, you want, you, this is my big thing. You never want to group on your face. Um, if there is like, did you say you never want to group on your face? 1000%. I cannot explain to you how many people will be like, oh, well, this laser is a hundred dollars. How amazing that should be a huge red flag. Got it. Got An it. Amazing provider will not be grouponing their services. Right. You're paying, you're not paying for the laser. You're not paying for Botox. You're paying for the years and time that that provider has poured into their education and their experience and becoming the best provider that they can be. And so you're really, you know, amazing professionals out there are not going to be the ones doing group on deals and all this stuff, you know, so you just have to really pay attention to where you're going. Um, and it, ma it definitely matters. You know, your safety is a number one. And in our practice here, like that is, that always comes first, patient safety. And so we want great results, but we have to keep you safe first. And then after the V-beam, what's next? Okay, um, next would be a resurfacing type laser. Which I've actually, I've done that. So, Moxie, right? Did you do the Moxie? I did, I've done a Moxie laser, which I only did because you told me to do it. Yeah. And I, I did it locally where I am. And then I did a, a CO2, CO2 Fraxel, yeah. which by the way, I looked like, um, yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. That was intense. Yes. So both of those I love. Um, and it depends on how aggressive you want to go. But a resurfacing laser is going to be the kind of laser that you go for when you want overall texture, you know, improvement in texture of your skin and kind of like an overhaul for your skin. And is a Moxie a newer laser? Yeah, it's okay. newer. It's been around for a few years, but it is such an incredible technology. We have it and we use it all day, every day. It's how does it work? So I don't even know how it works. I just did it because you told me. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I'm a good stomach. I take direction well. Yeah, You yeah. are amazing. Um, Moxie targets the water molecule in the skin. So it's a really neat technology because all skin types can, can get Moxie. So with certain lasers, darker skin types cannot get it done, but Moxie, all skin types, which makes it really cool. Um, it's great for melasma because of the way it targets the water and not the melanin. It doesn't heat it up. So we can actually treat melasma, which is really the only laser that I recommend for melasma is Moxie. And that's not because we have it here. It's truly the only technology Got out it. there that is good for melasma. Um, but it also resurfaces the skin. So think of it as like a shrink wrap like effect on your pores and your texture. And it's just amazing. It gives a great collagen boost. And that's the thing with a lot of these lasers, they're gonna stimulate collagen growth and production. So when we injure our collagen with heat, your body's response to that is to build it back up, bigger, better, stronger. So you get a collagen boost. You'll see that initially after a couple weeks, you get a little glow, but that collagen building keeps coming for weeks and months to come post laser. Um, so Moxie's gonna be one that you can do for resurfacing that's on the less aggressive end in terms of downtime. You'll be, you know, you probably wear a little red, a little swollen, but you can throw some makeup on. You can kind of keep and moving. And this is for everybody, right? This Every, is for everybody. Everybody could benefit from... Honestly, from pretty much everybody could benefit from Moxie. I mean, there's going to be the exceptions to the cause, but Moxie is a pretty mm -hmm. well-rounded laser. And would you say it's safe? Very safe. When, when in the hands of the right person, it's a safe laser for all skin types. It really is. Um, CO2 is different. That is very, very aggressive and uh, very <laughs> aggressive <laughs> and only good for yeah. certain skin types. You know, very dark skin should not get CO2. Someone with a history of, you know, uh, hypo or hyperpigmentation should probably not get CO2. There's, we take a very thorough intake for CO2. Um, it's a big downtime. You're looking at 10 to 14 days burn victim status. It's, it's yeah. intense, but if you're someone that really needs an overhaul and who would need, and who would need, um, so is Fraxel just the brand name or is yeah, it called a CO2 resurfacing? Laser? Fraxel is a fractionated laser. So kind of in that same category. Um, someone that needs that is going to be your more mature skin. Um, somebody who has a lot of laxity, fine lines and wrinkles who just really 
wants to kind of turn over skin cells and just maybe it's that person that just hasn't been taking care of their skin and is like, I, I need the big guns, you know? Right. Um, so if you've been doing really, really good with your maintenance treatments along the way, you can save that for later. It's mm -hmm. honestly nice. A lot of surgeons will pair CO2 with a facial surgery so that you can recover all at once. Um, but more mature skin, more for wrinkling, things mm -hmm. like that. Some people will do CO2 for acne scarring, but it's just one thing to do for acne scarring. Acne scarring is so hard to treat. And I tell patients, you're only going to get about a 50% improvement with CO2 and acne scarring. That's, um, that is important to know, right? So that way you're, you're kind of laying what the potential is for improvement. When I did the, the Fraxel, I really wanted something that was going to work fast and not have a ton of maintenance, right? So you can do it once and from what I understand, you don't have to do it for a couple years. If you ever do it again, I don't know if I'll ever do it again. <laughs> I know. Uh, it's but, kind of like having a baby. Yeah. You Enough time goes by and you're like, yeah, I'll do that we'll again. We'll see. We'll see. <laughs> um, in terms of acne, what are some of the, the biggest causes of acne? You know, guys always ask about back acne, yeah. uh, hormonal acne. How do you treat it both? Uh, do you recommend spironolactone, which is oral? Is that something that yeah. you guys use or are there more topical type treatments? Acne is so, it's so tough. It's, it's a, it's a four letter word. That's like a punch <laughs> to the gut. It's just acne is so debilitating for so many. And I've watched so many patients that really just ruins their confidence. And I hate acne so much, but, um, it's tricky to treat because it depends on, is your acne inflammatory? Is it non-inflammatory? how inflamed is it? And that's going to dictate which products we're using. Um, but really finding the, the cause of acne is so important. And so that's probably where Dr. Gabrielle, you help so many people with gut issues, diet, stress, all of those variables that lead to acne. There's, we can help a lot on this side of things with treating it and making it go away faster and helping with some of the residual effects. But a lot of times we are trying to direct people to figure out, okay, what are you, what's going on with your diet? How clean is your diet? How is your gut health? Like lifestyle, those pieces matter so much. If it's coming, um, with hormonal acne, like birth control, is it pregnancy Does birth related? control help? the acne or? You see it both ways. You see it almost like a Band-Aid for some, and then the minute they come off the birth control, it goes crazy. Um, and it usually takes people three to six months after coming off of a birth control or any kind of hormonal agent to like re, you know, level mm -hmm. out. Um, so hormones can definitely play and play a role. And depending on the time of your life, if you're premenopausal or, you know, you'll see changes in your skin with those things. So depending on the cause of the acne will also help us dictate how are we going to treat this acne. So what are some of the top treatments for acne or even the one, you know, I, I take care of a lot of women and maybe they're perimenopausal or menopausal and they'll be, they'll say to me, how am I having acne yeah. right now? I they haven't had this since I was a teen. What would you do with them? They need a good skincare plan. So if it's that hormonal acne that's coming up, you know, cyclically, cyclical with their with their cycle, they need to just be on a really good skincare routine so that they are exfoliating and hydrating properly at all times. And that will really cut down on the breakouts and it will cut them down and it'll make them go away faster when they do come. And so good skincare will kind of curb acne in that way. Um, in terms of like a spironolactone and things like that, um, sometimes your dermatologist might put you on that if you're having a lot of cystic acne and things like that. But we try to avoid people needing that if we yeah. can with topicals first, and then we use that as more of a second line of defense. Same with Accutane. We try everything we can before people go to a prescription drug, an oral drug. That makes sense. So for hormonal acne, the best way to do it is to do one of those exfoliating agents. Would that be salicylic acid? Yeah. Salicylic would be an amazing choice. Um, we have, you know, like weekly at home treatments that you can use with medical grade skincare. Getting regular facials is very helpful. So they help because people always say, yeah. oh, a facial is just to make you feel good, but not not a good medical mm. facial. So if you go to like a spa, like Four Seasons, and trust me, I love doing <laughs> this too, that is definitely going to be more like, oh, let's get pampered and wash our face. This feels so good and relaxing. Are you kidding? The idea um, of pampering is like, don't touch me. Leave yeah. me in the hotel room. <laughs> we were just talking about No this. children. No, just like pure style. I am not coming out of this hotel room. I just... <laughs> I'm going to watch a movie and order room service. I no, would feel totally... You're bad. talking my love language right now. That sounds <laughs> dreamy. Um, but yes, those kinds of facials, you're right. Those are more pampering. Those are feel-good facials. If you go to a medical practice that is more treatment-based, like 
hey, this facial, the goal is anti-aging or the goal is to help me with my acne or my rosacea, the, that facial is going to be more geared for skin conditions. And so within that facial, there's a lot of treatments going on. There might be peels going on, extractions, chemical treatments. So there's things that we're doing to treat and prevent acne and things like that. One of the, the listeners asked about a chemical peel. They asked, do they work? Um, is it used under the eye? Is it used all over the face? How do you know what to ask for? Chemical peels are amazing. That would definitely fall wonderfully in the acne category. Our acne patients, typically we do have on a series of chemical peels and it's going to depend on what you're doing your peel for, but pretty much everyone out there can benefit from a peel at some point. Um, and what a peel is going to do is exfoliate your skin. So it's going to slough off that outer layer of dead skin and it's going to kill bacteria, you know, acne, it's going to brighten you up. It's going to get rid of that dull skin and, and polish your skin. So how aggressive you want to go, that's up to you. If you're like, I want to do this huge, crazy peel, you're going to be peeling like a snake for like seven days. If you want to do a lunchtime peel, you could come in and get just a very light peel where you don't actually even peel from that, but you're still going to reap those benefits. It's going to tighten up your pores. It's going to give you a great glow. Um, so if you're somebody dealing with acne, getting on a series of regular peels will actually purge some of that old, gross acne out of your skin. That's interesting. So it, it does take a, a bit of work. Yeah. All right. You ready for the number one? Okay. I want to know the, I'm putting you on the spot here. The okay. number, if I can read my doctor writing, <laughs> <laughs> nobody else can read it. I need the decoder <laughs> ring. Um, the number one thing you should avoid when going to the drugstore for your skin. Oh, from the drugstore. I would say anything with like be careful with those. I feel like right now masks are super hot. I just think it's like I may or may not have about 10 of them <laughs> in my bag. Masks are really popular right now. You know, skincare comes yeah. in trends and in waves too. And so I'm seeing a lot of those crazy like jelly masks and stuff like that. And I would say just be careful with that kind of stuff because although it's fun, that stuff just sits on the surface. It doesn't really penetrate and it causes a lot of irritation. Um, so, you know, just dermatitis, irritation, rashes, and just aggravates your skin. So then when you go to do your skincare routine or use good products, you're almost like working against yourself. So just keeping it simple and trying not to add those fluffy things in. The other thing I, I get so crazy about that patients get from the drugstore are those dermaplane blades that they do themselves. And I'm not a fan of any kind of little at-home devices like the at-home rollers or blades or which any I, of that. Which I did get the at-home <laughs> roller. I think I sent you a picture of that. I think I was probably like, no, <laughs> that's exactly right. And Aries is playing with them. I'm like, oh God, just, we're just Be careful with those because a lot of times they just cause irritation. They introduce bacteria. They're not really doing what you want. Like people want a good dermaplane or a good needle. But I will say the TikTok videos with them all yeah. make it look like it's amazing. That's why TikTok and all of these videos are a blessing and a curse. It's a blessing because I love that people are getting educated, but then they see some crazy stuff and then they try to go do it. Anything invasive at home, don't try. The dermaplaning, the derma rollers. What about, what is the, the most important thing you should get from the drugstore? That's a great question. And something I have all of my, you know, instruct all of my patients, if you... Medical grade skincare is more costly. It is an investment, but I will tell you less is more and you don't need a lot of it. You get to use it very sparingly. So a little goes a long way. Typically the products you know, should last you three to five months. Um, but with that said, maybe you're going to have some of your routine that's medical grade and some of it's not. And if it's not, I recommend keeping the things that you can very basic. So cleansers and moisturizers from the drugstore are perfect when you do Cetaphil, CeraVe, or Vanny Wash. Those are my three top recommended drugstore brands because they're very vanilla. And what I mean by that is there's not any junk in them. They're clean. They're basic. They're going to do a great job of cleansing and moisturizing your skin without irritating. Which they is pair. the goal. Yes. Right? You don't need to have a big fancy cleanser yes. if you're just trying to keep your, your skin clean. It's yeah. not like the exfoliant, which seems to be much more important. Exactly. So what about moisturizer? From the drugstore or just in general? I would say from the drugstore, stick with those. CeraVe... Cetaphil or oh, baby cream. So they're also moisturizers yep, as well. Yes, they have cleansers and moisturizers. Okay, got it. Um, the difference in a medical grade moisturizer is going to be they're going to hydrate you just like those drugstore ones will, but they contain the anti-aging components. So ours are going to have, medical grade um, moisturizers are going to have hyaluronic acid in them that plumps and hydrates and anti-ages the skin. It's going to have peptides, cholesterols, fatty acids, things that really just nourish and anti-age along with hydrating. 
How long would you use these products before you know how before you know if they're working or you should switch? Do people talk about oh, skincare yeah. holidays or I use this conditioner and then I had to switch it in a month? You know, I've used this skincare for two months and then I want to switch it. How long does it take yeah. for someone to know if it works? So you have to be patient and consistency is key with all skincare. And some products you're going to see, honestly, after one use, like an at-home peel pad or something like that, you're going to notice a difference the next day. Um, so you'll feel some of them more than others right away. But on average, I would say a good two to four weeks, you're going to really see some great change. But to reach goals, you really need eight to 12 weeks of consistency. So I tell people, don't change it up too much. Sometimes you have to get through purging. You have to get through shedding of dead skin and stay consistent to your plan so that you can really see the real results. Um, and then once you're, you know, acclimated to those products, then you can shake things up, add things, change things, whatever, but you don't want to change too much in the beginning. So that's actually a long period of time. That's about three months. Yeah. It can take people three months, especially if you're an acne sufferer, um, and you're, you know, you're going to see some, it looks worse before it gets better. It's going to pull some of that acne out. And so that's where my acne people, they always want to throw the, t oh, this isn't working for me. Like, no, 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 this is a good thing. Keep going. Give me 12 weeks. And then by 12 weeks, like, this is amazing. I love this so much. I can't believe I almost quit. That's like how it is with my patient. If you're my patient, you better not be doing that. <laughs> In terms of how long they can actually stay on that before they should switch it up, does the skin actually get acclimated to a particular routine where maybe it becomes ultimately less effective? Yes, you can plateau. And so if you get to a point where you're like, I just feel like nothing's changing, I'm feeling kind of dull, I need to shake things up, mm -hmm. then we need to maybe switch products up, increase the intensity of the way you're using it, um, stack products, things like that. And then also we take into account the time of the year because your skincare routine might change a little bit. So in the winter, just you know, by nature of things, we're going to be a little bit more dry. The heaters are on, the air is more dry. Um, so you need more hydration. So we're going to change things with the season. And then as you plateau, do you think that hydration makes a big difference? Like oral hydration in skin? Oh yes, it does so much, so much. I'm the worst. So <laughs> please do as I say, not as I do. I am the worst water drinker ever. I'm trying to be better. Um, but you have to drink so much water. you you will notice a notable difference, especially in your under eye area. I mean, when you're dehydrated versus hydrated, your skin naturally is going to be more plump. This episode of the Dr. Gabrielle Lyon Show is brought to you by First Form. I want to highlight collagen. I'm sure you can guess why, because this is an episode on skin and skin care. Collagen is not great for building muscle, but it sure is great for skin. And First Form has a low temperature processed hydrolyzed collagen it's very high quality, very bioavailable. They sourced five different types of collagen. And I am telling you, it has a very diverse profile. You can mix it in anything. I mix it in coffee. Sometimes I'll throw it in a yogurt or cottage cheese. I love this. It has 50 milligrams of dermaval in it. And this is a phytonutrient rich complex. And the goal of it is to help maintain healthy levels of elastin in the body. Collagen is a great building structure. While elastin is responsible for elasticity and firmness of the skin, there is only so much you can put on topically. You have to get the rest internally. You need to have a diet rich in fatty acids. Collagen, we definitely don't eat enough of it. So adding it in really can help the effect on the skin. Definitely is in the science and I really, really appreciate it. I think you will too. Head on over to First Form that's one s t p h o r m dot com slash Dr Lion. They have different flavors. I go with the natural collagen. I've been doing that lately. I know that you're going to love it, and they've got the best customer service on the planet. And what about alcohol? Does uh, it <laughs> <laughs> big time? I laugh because I'm just, oh, it's so controversial now about alcohol. But again, we've said that we are now in 2022, and everything is very controversial. is controversial. Um, what about alcohol? Alcohol will do a number on your skin too. And I'm not talking about like if you have a glass of wine at dinner, I don't think you're going to see too much there. But if you're consuming alcohol regularly, your skin will be more dehydrated. And you'll also just struggle more with issues in volume on the face when your hydration levels change like that, particularly the under eye area. Um, we have a Maylar fat pad here. And so that's, I get a lot of that where patients come in and like, some days my eyes look horrible, some days they look good. And it's a lot of that has to do with the fluctuation of your water, how much water you're holding on to. For example, if you have 
you know, margaritas and Mexican food, like I'm puffy the next Nobody day. Nobody does that. My, <laughs> my rings are tight. My eyes look a little puffy. And then when you're eating super clean, you're going to notice less of that. So water intake is definitely, it matters. What about the topical vitamins, vitamin C, vitamin E, we talked about vitamin A, are it, do those make a difference? Yes, big time. Um, really everyone should use a vitamin C. Um, and a lot of the vitamin C serums are going to have the vitamin E in them. They're usually combined. Um, but that is just a great staple for a skincare routine and it's for overall skin health. So with a vitamin C serum, it's kind of different than an exfoliating product where when you use it, you may not necessarily see what's happening right away, but you have to trust the process and know that it's working inside your skin. So vitamin C and um, by topical vitamins in general are going to really protect you from the sun. It kind of builds your own natural UVA and UVB protection inside your skin. And then the big thing they do is they fight off free radicals. So pollution, smoking, alcohol, um, just environmental dangers, all those things that make those little unstable molecules, it fights that off. So it keeps you healthy from cancer and just anti-aging and all of those things. So it's a way to really keep the inside of your skin healthy. Um, and with vitamin C, the big thing to know about that, that's another one where when you asked about drugstore, I would not do a drugstore vitamin C. Um, a lot of those types of vitamin Cs are not going to penetrate. So a medical grade vitamin C is important because with vitamin C formulation is key. Um, it's a very unstable molecule, molecule. So in order for it to get into your skin, it has to be made stable through the formulation of the product. So there's certain ways we formulate a vitamin C to make sure that it actually gets into the skin and you're getting the full dose. And so a good vitamin C, you want to look that it has a high percentage of vitamin C, um, like 21% or more, uh, vitamin E, ferulic acid, um, and yeah. a little ferulic acid is just another one of those brightening acids and it's going to help with skin health. Um, and then it's also just going to brighten your skin and that's going to pair and help the vitamin C to penetrate into the skin. So when we pair things with an acid, the acid's kind of like the vehicle that will drive it deeper into the skin. Um, and that's why I love to have my Retin-A users also use it with vitamin C and help drive it into the skin. Do they use it together or do they have to wait a couple minutes? Does it cancel each other out? Does it decrease the potency if you're stacking it? I say that it's kind of like peanut butter and jelly. They go together really well. So <laughs> That you, sounds good. <laughs> you can separate them and that's okay, but I like to have my patients do your retinol and then put some vitamin C serum on top or vice versa. You can. There's really no right or wrong way. And that's where a lot of people get hung up to with skincare. Um, some of it's just trial and error on your own skin. You have to see what you like. Um, there are certain rules to follow, thin to thick, clear to cloudy when you're layering products. But I always remind people, your skin has no idea what time of day it is. So if you prefer vitamin C at night versus morning, that's totally fine. Um, you know, just kind of pairing it in there. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, just curious, how many times a day should someone actually wash their, their face? Um, it depends on how your day is going, but... One for sure, maybe two, maybe three. So before bed, everyone should wash their face. Really? Um, I, I mean, I'm just thinking maybe there's a skin microbiome that we just leave as is. Well, but. if we weren't putting makeup or anything on our face, but you have to think, if you go all day long, just from outside, the air is dirty. So we're, our skin is not clean by the time you're going to bed. So, and this is, we're talking about a gentle cleanser. So just a nice gentle cleanser, nothing harsh, just to simply clean your skin off from the, just the junk that might be sitting on top. And for us women, especially who wear makeup, we have to do a double cleanse at night. So the first cleanse is just simply, think of it as just getting the makeup and just the layer of, of junk off the skin, and then you're gonna pat dry. And then the second cleanse is actually the deeper cleanse that's really cleaning your skin and that's gonna prepare your skin to accept all the products you're about to put on. I have not been doing that. <laughs> <laughs> okay, now we're gonna do double cleansing. Um, people always ask me about cellulite and stretch marks. What do you got for me? Hot topics. Those are very <laughs> hot topics. Okay. So my stretch mark answer is not, it doesn't make people happy, but there's no cure or magic remedy for stretch marks. Stretch marks are extremely genetic, extremely familial. So if your mother or grandmother had stretch marks through pregnancy um, or maybe like a huge weight loss change, um, it's possible that you could have them too. It's more likely, not necessarily, you know, factual, but you can have them. Um, do you ever see that in guys, stretch marks yeah. from growing? Yes, I should have mentioned that too. Yes. 
it, it's just definitely a genetic component. There's a tie there. Um, not always, but with that said, um, there's no cream, there's no treatment that we offer, like needling or anything like that, that's just going to get rid of them, to be honest. And so. That's interesting because that's what I've read is oh. that needling would be the. the needling thing. would yeah. be the one, if you were to say, what's one treatment you could do, it would that be. That sounds so painful. Needling. It's not that bad. It's, it's, it's honestly not. It feels more like a vibration than anything. It's a little pen and the tip oscillates very quickly. So the little needles make little micro focused injuries that will then build collagen does help with scarring, could lighten stretch marks, but it's not going to erase them the way people think that they will. So with aesthetic procedures like that, we have to really set clear expectations, like maybe give you some improvement, but definitely not perfection. And so really the only way, if you have stretch marks, you know, in a certain area from pregnancy or weight loss and you really want them gone, it really requires surgical excision. And so that's where, you know, a plastic surgeon can do an abdominoplasty and remove some of that skin. Yeah, that, that's interesting. I had a, a mentor and a really good friend. His name is Charles Poliquin, and he created this, I don't know if it was the sup, supplement formula of removing stretch marks over a period of time. And I swear some people say, yeah, this totally works. And other people are saying, you know, it's there's nothing that you can do for stretch marks. Yeah. I feel like if I knew of it, if I knew of something that really worked, I would I would have a line out the street right now. Um, what, what about cellulite? <laughs> cellulite can be improved with certain aesthetic um, procedures. And again, with all these things, it's improvement, not perfection. But cellulite's another one that is very genetic. And I'll have people come in that are this teeny tiny and they have cellulite. So it's not always something that has to do with weight per se, but that can definitely be a factor. And it's and not so, a magic fat, right? It's not some kind no, of... No, it's just normal different. fat. It's the fibers. So if you look at what cellulite is, we have little fat pockets. And on on the side of the fat pocket, there's little fibrous connective tissue. Think of them as like rubber bands. And then once that fat pocket is full of fat, the rubber bands, the septae get pulled down under pressure. And so where they're pulled down, you see that dip in the skin or that dent. And so cellulite is more so the kind that you could like kind of stick your thumb in and see that it's like a little dent or a spot. And that's a cellulite dimple. So those, we do have some aesthetic treatments. There's no topicals that will reduce that. What you have to do is you have to either release those bands. And would that be, that would be surgical or um, not necessarily? Not necessarily surgical. surgical. There's treatments out there called Selfina and there's an injectable now that we have that actually eats away at the collagen of those bands um, that will give you some improvement or weight loss sometimes will help. Um, but again, if you're somebody who's already at your goal weight and super tiny and has it, weight loss really isn't the answer for you. So that's why it just kind of depends on, you know, if it's a weight loss issue or if there's just certain targeted spots, then you would be a really good candidate for one of those treatments. Thank you to Inside Tracker for sponsoring this episode of the show. Head on over to insidetracker.com slash Dr. Lyon right now. 20% off for anything in the store. And why do you care about this? Because you care about what's going on inside the body, especially if we're talking about skin health. Skin health is definitely related to hormonal health as well as inflammatory markers. It's really important to know what's going on inside, hence the name Inside Tracker. It provides all your personalized information, a plan to improve your metabolism, reduce stress, even improve sleep. It's created by leading scientists in aging, genetics, and biometrics. Inside Tracker analyzes your blood, DNA, and even fitness tracking data. In fact, I have many patients that choose to go to Inside Tracker and get blood work and then bring those results to me. We love it, and it's important to know what's going on. And for a limited time only, you'll get 20% off the entire Inside Tracker store. Just go to insidetracker.com forward slash Dr. Lyon. That's insidetracker.com forward slash Dr. Lyon. Basically, what you're saying is that there is no magical topical cream. Yes. That is going to work. I feel like work. that's what people want. That's when they what people, ask that. I think that that's there, what people want. There is not, maybe someday though, that's the cool thing about aesthetic medicine. This world is ever evolving and we have new technologies and treatments literally every day. So I'm confident in this lifetime we'll see something good. I get a lot of questions about Botox, injectables. Do I think that they're safe? Um, and, you know, it's interesting. In, I think, the space of health and wellness, you will have people that are super healthy doing their whatever juice cleanse, but definitely in line for Botox and oh, filler. For sure. <laughs> and, uh, you know, you look at some of these comments online and people are, you know, they're so judgmental about injectables. 
I don't know if you experienced that, if you have thought about it at all, because it, it's so ridiculous in, in my yeah, perspective. It is, and it's, um, it's not about vanity. It's just like anything. Do you color your hair? Have you painted your nails? Do you put some makeup on? It's just about taking care of yourself. It's like the same people who work out because they want their bodies to be in shape and healthy, want their skin and their face to be healthy. And so injectables are completely safe when they're done properly and when they're done by the right medical professional. Um, Botox, for example, has been used in the human body for ages and we use it for a lot of therapeutic reasons. Um, Time Magazine did a really cool article on this years ago on like, I think it was like the thousand uses of Botox and it's the prostate, the bladder, neuromuscular disorders. Um, it's using the human body for all sorts of things. And when we use them on those larger organs for that kind of therapeutic cause, we use, you know, hundreds and hundreds of units. When we're doing little cosmetic Botox on the face, we're using like, you know, 25 to 50. So it's a very small amount. Um, but even in those larger doses, it's very safe. Um, and when you break it down the way that the drug acts on the body, it, it's actually safer than Tylenol. And I'll explain that to patients and they'll be like, wow. Um, so it's very safe. And again, it's all about the, the aesthetic outcome and that's where it matters who is administering it. So if you're going to some random Botox party and the person doesn't understand the anatomy of the face or the muscles it should and shouldn't go in, that's where you get into trouble. Um, or when you see people who over just anything in moderation, anything in excess, you see people who are overdone, it looks ridiculous. Um, but you probably see people every day, all day who have beautiful aesthetic treatments you wouldn't even know. Right. In terms of Botox, who is there someone that it's not for? Now, Botox is not uh, systemic, right. right? It is a local injection. Yeah. It's a neuromuscular paralyzer. Who is it not for? There, believe it or not, there's not many contraindications with Botox. There's a few things. Um, myasthenia gravis is one that's an ultimate no, and then sometimes Guillain-Barre. But outside of that, pretty much everyone is a candidate for Botox. I mean, we'll do a thorough health history and just make sure nothing stands out. Um, there's certain times I have people refrain if they're breastfeeding, pregnant. Um, and just to be clear, even though it's not it you know it's essentially contraindicated in pregnancy and breastfeeding it again it's likely because those studies have not been in those populations but it's not because it actually goes systemic true. that is true it's um we don't have those fda approved right. trials to say as a as a practitioner i can't say yes this is completely safe because we don't have the clinical data to support that but what we know about it is exactly that it does not get into your bloodstream it does not get to the baby um Actually, I have a story. When I was pregnant with the twins, I was seeing an MFM, a maternal fetal medicine specialist, because identical twins are high risk. And she actually became my patient during the process, and I was doing her Botox, and I said something like, oh, I cannot wait to get mine. And she's like, you're not doing it? And I was like, well, no, I'm pregnant, pregnant. with the twins. And yeah. she's like, oh, you can do Botox. So I was like, it's so interesting. You know, here's a high risk OB telling you Botox in pregnancy, is, it's fine. Um, but it's more of a liability as the provider. Um, and also for my patient's mental health, because if something were to happen, Absolutely. I don't even Absolutely. want them to have to think through, could it have been my Botox? So I just have them wait until they're done. Other injectables. It seems like there's a new injectable coming out all the time. Yeah. Um, there are. It's We're getting more and more. The por portfolios are getting bigger and bigger, which is a great thing because we have more options and the products are getting, the technology is getting better. Um, filler is a big one. And so those are going to be your hyaluronic acid fillers. And those are made from so hyaluronic acid, which is a carbohydrate that's in our bodies. It's naturally occurring. So they're very safe and they actually are completely reversible. So that gives a lot of people peace of mind knowing if you try filler and you don't like it or you want to tweak something, we always keep the enzyme on hand. It's called hyaluronidase. And that's an enzyme that can be injected into the filler and it just breaks it up. Um, but without it, fillers last a long time. So your fillers last anywhere from one, two plus years. Um, and fillers think revolumization. So the big thing that happens to the face as we age is we lose volume. So our fat pads in the face, those atrophy. And as we lose fat, why does it have to? I know. Atrophy? Why can't it atrophy in your butt? It's not fair. Why? Because it's it just atrophy grows in your on face? your butt. This makes no sense. There's a, that's a massive design flaw. Yeah, it's that's it's not fair. Um, so we try to restore those fat pads because you have to think when you lose the fat in the face, that tissue that was once supporting and lifting everything up is now gone. So it's like the balloon has been deflated. Everything is just dropping. Our folds get heavier. We feel more laxity in the lower face. 
So when we revolumize with fillers, we kind of lift everything back up a little bit, restore those volumes. Now, speaking of aging, is what is the first sign of aging in a male versus a female? Oh, that's a good one. Um, it, it's going to depend, but I would say just with society, I think males get away with certain things that females don't. And um, males can have certain lines and wrinkles and it makes them sexy. Whereas a female, yeah, as a, like the salt and pepper, you know, hair, whereas a female, it's like, oh, we can't have those lines. We look mad or mean, you know? So, um, I think it depends because on males, I would say more of them are concerned with their crow's feet around their eyes. I feel like I get a lot of men who have the deep smile lines. Do you guys do eyes. Botox or they're more interested in prevention of deeper lines and maintaining their elasticity? I have a lot of male patients, but I would say, um, I would say my male patients aren't as good about preventing as they are correcting. They'll come in once the lines are there and they're like, hey, I've been noticing these lines. I want to minimize them. Do they have a stigma? Like, don't tell anyone I'm coming in to get Botox. It's probably 50-50. I feel like some do and then some just own it and they're like, Hey, what's up? I'm on my way to my Botox appointment. You know, I, <laughs> yeah. I want to look good too. So especially, you know, business professionals, people out in the workforce, you know, they want to look good and they want to look their part. And so they want to feel good. So I think that the stigma has definitely gotten so much better over the years. I mean, 13 years ago, nobody talked about these things. It was so hush hush. And now everyone talks about it. Everyone does it. And hopefully people will just share what they do so they can help other people. Well, I love what you do, and I think that you're an amazing provider and so knowledgeable on all things skincare, not even just skincare, but, you know, exercise, being a mom, running a business. This business is beautiful and amazing, and you've created an incredible line of skincare, which, again, I've been using for quite some time. Where can people find you? Thank you so much. Um, our website is RaquelAesthetics.com, and on our site, you can shop our skincare, and I think the biggest thing that we try to do with our skincare, it's called RFA skincare, um, is we offer complimentary consulting with the product. So if you look and you feel that overwhelming feeling or you don't know where to start, you can fill out a form where we'll collect some photos and some information about your skin type, your goals, what's going on. And then we can help guide you to not only what products to use, but how to properly use them so that we can help people get the best results. So you can do all that on our website and also on my Instagram, which is just my name, Raquel Frisella. And I'll link everything. Links there. What is the, and my last question is, what is the number one thing you do for prevention for your on skin? My yeah. Let me get out the laundry list. <laughs> Here it comes. <laughs> um, honestly, I think what I wait, do. By the way, in order to work here, you have to look <laughs> absolutely flat. Walked in, I'm like, oh my god, what's wrong with this? Oh, you stop it! You are the, perfect. You know. So what is, what is the number? I one? I do. I think for me, it's honestly just consistency with a few things. So I'm I do my skincare every single day, like holy grail, obsessed with my skincare. I'm regular with Botox. I do Botox every three to four months and I do filler once a year. And I don't do a lot. I just do a little bits in areas where I've noticed, you know, volume kind of going away. Um, I also do an annual, see, I told you, get out the liners, <laughs> a laser every year. Um, so I'm going to do BBL and Moxie um, in a few weeks here. And that's just to, you know, maintain overall skin health. So there's no perfect order or, or rhyme mm -hmm. or reason to do it, but just chipping away at your skin all the time, just kind of getting routine with those maintenance treatments. Um, but above all, just doing your skincare every night. You know, I, I know I, I said that that was my last question for you, but I, I have another question. <laughs> <laughs> um, with the Botox and the fillers, do you have to keep it up or so for example if you put more volume in and then it goes away so if the filler only lasts two years or the botox lasts a, a period of time three months or something do you have to continue to do it will your skin look worse that's such a good question i get asked that a lot um no so good and bad it just slowly goes away over time i always explain to my patients it's like coloring your hair if you colored your hair and then you never did it again eventually that color grows out and you're back to baseline the same things happen the same thing happens with injectables so if you do botox and filler and then you just suddenly stop doing it just slowly over time you are going to return to baseline you're not going to be any worse than you were for doing it but you slowly will creep back to where you started and so that's why it does require maintenance but the maintenance gets easier over time. So the first time you do injectables, you may need a little bit more depending on when you're starting. Um, unless it's preventative, then you can just start doing a little bit here and there. And then you kind of never get to that point where you have to play catch up. 
Um, but then if you just kind of get routine with it, it's just, you kind of just slow the aging process, turn the, turn the hands of time back a little bit, and it just gets really easy to maintain. You don't need a whole bunch. Everyone is very happy to hear that. Um, thank you so much for spending time with me. I'm going to link all your information here. Again, I send almost everybody who asks me about skincare to you. I've been using your products for a really long time. In fact, I'm going to link my, You're my gonna, walking model. I mean, if you I want to look like Dr. Gabrielle. I'm going to put what I've been just obsessed with and using. And uh, thank you so much for Thank sharing you. Your time. Thank you for having me. You are a total badass. And I'm very, very honored to be on your amazing podcast. Mm-hmm.